Hello everyone, welcome back to History 2001, Launching America. In our last video, we discussed life in medieval Europe and on the verge of the so-called Age of Discovery in the late 1400s and early 1500s. We also discussed why Europeans during this period would have wanted to leave their homes in Europe to come to the Americas or the New World as it was often called. We define these reasons as push factors and pull factors. In this video, we're going to discuss the methods of colonization taken by some of the major European powers, how their attitudes and approaches towards the conquest and settlement of the new world, and how their approaches to this colonization were defined by their national histories. While many European nations, from the late 15th century well into the 1700s, established colonies in the Americas, we will discuss only four of the largest European colonizers, the Dutch, the French, the Portuguese, and the Spanish. We will talk about the English approach to colonization in future videos. Let's talk about the Spanish approach to colonization first. Since they were the first European power to establish colonies in the Americas, during the voyages of Christopher Columbus, discussed previously. We'll continue our discussion of Spanish colonization by considering Juan Ponce de Leon, the first confirmed European to visit the continental United States of America. I say confirmed because it's possible that the Vikings may have visited what will become roughly New England but we don't know for sure. The Vikings, remember, did not set up colonies in what would become the United States. They set up colonies in what would become Canada. Juan Ponce de Leon made his first expedition to Florida in the year 1513. He left established colonies in Puerto Rico and sailed north and west, deeper into the Caribbean and the Atlantic Oceans. Most likely, de Leon was looking for additional islands to colonize for Spain and additional wealth, particularly gold. The story of the Fountain of Youth that de Leon wanted to find, the mythical Fountain of Youth, has probably been exaggerated. Many Europeans at the time did believe that uh, the environmental resources of the Americas had supernatural powers, but it's also very likely that uh, the desire for wealth and the desire for land was a bigger uh, motivating factor for de Leon. Also, the story of de Leon looking for the Fountain of Youth doesn't come around until after uh, de Leon's death. Instead of finding eternal life in Florida, Juan Ponce de Leon met his end in the so-called Land of Flowers. Uh, he died in the year 1521 uh, after a later voyage to Florida. Uh, this second voyage traveled more along the uh, Gulf Coast of Florida. Um, he was shot with a poison arrow uh, in southwest Florida, and he succumbed to uh, this wound sometime later in Cuba. So technically he died in Cuba from a wound he sustained in Florida. Uh, de Leon and his party had planned to build a settlement in Florida, but this attack forestalled their plan. Uh, the indigenous people of, of Florida were very militarily formidable, and they had developed a very uh, sophisticated society. So. Setting up a settlement in Florida proved to be too difficult for de Leon and his followers. And it's not going to be for a couple more decades uh, will the Spanish set up a permanent colony in, in Florida. And that's going to be in 1565 at St. Augustine. Here's a map showing uh, La Florida. The map also shows the site where Juan Ponce de Leon was uh, supposedly mortally wounded. Remember, he did not actually die in Florida, he died in Cuba, but the wound that killed him, um, he experienced it in Florida. This is an artist's rendering of Don Pedro Menendez de Aviles' arrival in St. Augustine, Florida in 1565. Remember, the Spanish, they set up their first colony several decades after Ponce de Leon's initial um, explorations in Florida. We'll talk more in a few minutes about why the Spanish chose to set up colonies in Florida. This is a lithograph of the Spanish colony at St. Augustine, Florida. 
You can see in this slide that African enslaved people are displayed. This is because St. Augustine was actually the first European settlement to receive uh, African enslaved people. Um, and we believe that there were African enslaved people um, at uh, St. Augustine from its founding in 1565. I mention this because many people uh, erroneously think that uh, Jamestown 1619 was the first European colony to receive uh, enslaved Africans. In fact, Jamestown was the first English colony in uh, what will become the United States to receive enslaved people. This is the Castillo de San Marcos. Uh, it's a fortress built in 1672 out of uh, local Coquina stone. Um, this fortress replaced an older wooden fortress that had been destroyed, and the Castillo de San Marcos was built to protect the city of St. Augustine from both pirate attacks from the sea, but also from uh, possible indigenous attacks as well. Here is an aerial shot of the Castillo de San Marcos. This is the original 1670s fort here. It's built in uh, the bastion fort style. Basically, a bastion fort is meant to uh, have artillery, but not have too high of a profile. Uh, although it's called a castle, it's very different than a medieval castle. The idea is a fort with a lower profile um, will be less of a target for enemy artillery. These other portions outside of the fort were added on uh, much later. Uh, this fort was in operation um, well into the 19th century. Even after the United States took control of Florida, they still used the Castillo de San Mar Marcos as a, uh, a military installation. The United States was even using um, the Castillo de San Marcos during the Civil War and after. Here is an engraving of a uh, European meeting with some of the indigenous people of Florida. Observers of uh, indigenous people in Florida in the 1500s and 1600s observed that these people uh, were very tall, very muscular, and they were very formidable hunters and warriors. So it's unsurprising that uh, the Spanish were slower to um, colonize Florida. The indigenous people were, were very formidable opponents, and it wouldn't be until later in the 1500s that um, the cost benefit uh, would move in favor of the Spanish establishing a colony in, in Florida. Florida did not have the kind of gold and wealth that uh, parts of the Caribbean and Mesoamerica had. Um, Florida and St. Augustine really were set up as military outposts um, to protect Spanish shipping from, particularly from pirates, uh, other European pirates, especially the English and the French. European observers reported that the indigenous people of Florida engaged in cannibalism. This is a possibility. It's also possible though that the indigenous people of Florida ritually consumed the flesh of their enemies, similar to the Eastern woodland people who believed that by consuming the flesh of their enemies, they would uh, take on their enemy's power. Either way, um, rituals like this show the uh, military might of the indigenous people of Florida and why the Spanish would not immediately set up colonies um, on the Florida Peninsula, why they would wait over 40 years after Ponce de Leon's death to set up St. Augustine. This image illustrates the uh, height and athleticism of the indigenous people of Florida. Uh, European observers observed that um, these indigenous people were very tall, usually taller than Europeans, and they were very strong, very physically strong and very muscular and very athletic as well. All of these things would have made the indigenous people of Florida very formidable warriors. There were actually several different uh, groups or tribes of indigenous people that lived on the Florida Peninsula. Uh, there was the Tamuka, who lived in northeast Florida around the area of St. Augustine with whom de Leon would have come into contact during his initial voyage and with whom Menendez and the people who founded St. Augustine would have had uh, dealings. Further to the south on the east coast of Florida were the Hobe people. On the Gulf Coast were the uh, Calusa people 
and it's probably uh, the Calusa people who actually um, uh, wounded uh, Ponce de Leon, which led to his death. The uh, Seminole people, um, who many of whom still live in Florida today, would not migrate to Florida uh, until the 1700s, and they migrated from what is now generally Alabama. The indigenous people of Florida um, practiced various types of hunting, particularly hunting of alligators, shown here on this slide. They would uh, use a variety of ingenious methods to uh, kill these alligators. Um, and then they would take their kills and they would cook them over uh, barracas, similar to barbecue. So you can see uh, from the lifestyle of the indigenous people of Florida, um, from their techniques they use in hunting, while they also would have been very good fighters as well. In addition to being skilled hunters, the indigenous people of Florida also were very skilled builders. They would build lodges out of readily available plant materials, uh, like you can see here on this slide. Uh, some of these lodges would have been small, others would have been very large. They also built uh, mounds out of oyster shells. They would have eaten a lot of oysters in their diet. And instead of just throwing the shells away, they would uh, use these uh, discarded materials to build mounds, similar to the uh, mounds built by the Mississippian people to the north. Uh, these mounds um, often contained uh, human remains uh, of those um, honored dead who were buried, given the honor of being buried in the mounds. And we can see evidence of these shell mounds throughout Florida today. Uh, they also would have built canals, uh, seen here in this slide. Uh, these canals would have allowed them to drain portions of the Everglades and swampy parts of Florida. These canals also could be used um, basically as uh, a way of transportation. People could travel along these canals uh, using canoes. And the indigenous people of Florida often built walls around their settlements as well to fend off attacks. Remember, these are very militaristic societies. Here is an illustration of a uh, walled settlement in Florida. Like the Eastern Woodlanders, the indigenous people of Florida built walls around their settlements. These walls would have been built to fend off uh, initially in, in tax from other indigenous people, but eventually uh, attacks by uh, Europeans as well. Here is a close-up of a lodge or a reconstruction of a lodge that would have been built by uh, indigenous people in uh, Florida. These lodges primarily were made out of uh, layered and woven uh, palm fronds or palm branches and leaves. And oftentimes these lodges were built uh, around or on top of oyster shells. When Europeans arrived in, in Florida, they actually copied some elements of indigenous architecture. Um, they would actually take oyster shells for themselves and they would mix them with sand and ash to create what is called a uh, tabby. Tabby is actually a type of uh, concrete, basically. So what you see is that uh, Europeans are learning um, from indigenous people how to uh, better live in the Americas. The indigenous people of Florida used canoes to travel across the many waterways, both natural and artificial uh, in Florida. Remember, some of these peoples made canals. Um, the type of canoe they made were dugout canoes. Basically, they would cut down a tree, usually a cypress tree, and then they would uh, set fires on the top of the cypress log, and then they would dig out the ash to create a type of canoe. This is different than the canoes made by the people of the eastern woodlands who use bark from birch trees. So once again you're seeing indigenous people adapting their life ways for the environmental resources they have based on where they're living. In terms of military technology, the indigenous people of Florida, they used bows and arrows, they used spears and other, other types of weapons. Here are some modern artistic reconstructions of what the indigenous people of Florida may have looked like. Now that we've discussed the Spanish exploration of Florida under uh, Juan Ponce de Leon and others and the people they encountered, uh, 
we'll turn our discussion to the Spanish model of colonization once again. Spain was a Catholic power and was very interested in spreading Catholic Christianity to the people of the Americas, whom they recognized were not Christians. As a matter of fact, Native Americans did not practice any religions that Europeans were familiar with, like Buddhism, Judaism, or Islam. Spanish colonizers, from the beginning of their expeditions, would try to convert Native Americans to their faith, hoping to then use these converted natives as guides who would show them the wealth of the New World, and who would also act as intermediaries between the settlers and other indigenous people, while also spreading the, the Christian faith. Early on, the Spanish believed that Amerindians were not necessarily inferior to themselves once they had adopted Christianity. The Spanish best practice for Native American relations was to treat Christianized natives as equals to Europeans and brothers and sisters of the faith, although this did not always occur, as we shall see later on. Non-Christian Amerindians were to be regarded as the other, enemies to be defeated in battle or enslaved on the encomiendas with the hope that Spanish military force and a threat of slavery might entice Native Americans to convert to Christianity. The Spanish believed that this kind of forceful encroachment on the New World, including the invasion of Native American civilizations and the acculturation of indigenous people, was acceptable, even permissible, because they were accomplishing this conquest in the name of Christianity and the supposedly benevolent Spanish crown. As such, Spanish colonizers recognized that it was very important to show the symbols of their power, the crucifix and the seal of the Spanish monarchy, to signal the establishment of new settlements in the Americas. Perhaps the best example of Spain's colonial model can be seen in the Spanish conquest of Mesoamerica, primarily present-day Mexico. Hernán Cortés, leader of this colonial expedition from 1519 to 1522, demonstrated many of Spain's archetypal colonial patterns. Cortés heralded himself as a representative of the Spanish monarch, in this case, Charles V, who was also the Holy Roman Emperor. Ironically, Cortés's expedition was illegal and not sanctioned by the Spanish crown, and he had to fight off colonial authorities even as he struggled against the Aztecs. The Aztec Empire was the predominant military and cultural power in Mesoamerica, and Cortes and his men made their way to the Aztec capital of Tenochtitlan with the help of indigenous guides who converted to Christianity, like Malinche, or Doña Maria, as the Spanish called her. Malinche would also become a lover of Cortes as well. Along the way, the Spanish, with the help of these native interpreters slash diplomats, made alliances with other indigenous civilizations, including the Tlaxcalans, bitter enemies of the Aztecs, who were in the midst of a flower war with the Aztec people, a conflict in which Mesoamerican armies fought each other in order to gain human sacrificial victims. Human sacrifice was a major part of Aztec culture, and indeed the cultures of the other indigenous peoples of Mesoamerica. Their culture was also very similar to that of the Mississippian people of the North American Southeast, whom we discussed in a previous video. Both cultures constructed pyramids and had large cities with thousands of inhabitants, including slaves. These societies were very unequal, with stratified political, religious, and military classes. Scholars think that mass human sacrifice and the occasional ritual consumption of the flesh of sacrificial victims, in addition to having a religious meeting, also served as a distraction intended to keep the commoners from revolting against the elite. These sacrifices were great spectacles and accompanied by feasting and celebration. Essentially, these mass sacrifices were religious holidays 
in which the Mesoamericans honored their gods and praised their own culture, including the valor of the warriors, who captured sacrificial victims from other Mesoamerican peoples. The Aztecs believed that the blood of sacrificial victims, drained from their chest cavities after their still beating hearts had been cut out, assured that their sun god, Huitzilopochtli, would make the sun rise and keep the earth from descending into eternal darkness. In some cases, being sacrificed would have been considered an honor in Aztec society, as the victims were giving their lives to save the world, although most victims probably died unwillingly, being that they were prisoners. While human sacrifice gave cohesion to Aztec society, it would also be its undoing, as the sacrifices and the wars that accompanied them led many Mesoamerican city-states to ally themselves with Cortes against the Aztecs, their common enemy. Cortes's Spanish party of conquistadors, with its indigenous auxiliaries, traveled through Mexico and reached the capital of the Aztec Empire, Tenochtitlan, where they became guests of Montezuma, the Aztec ruler. Montezuma had already heard about the visitors from the sea, and he knew of their power, and probably wanted to impress Cortes in order to have him as a potential ally. Contrary to popular opinion, there is no credible evidence to indicate that the Aztecs believed that the Spanish were gods. Cortes and his men were in awe of the wealth and opulence of the Aztec capital. Situated on a network of artificial islands, Tenochtitlan had a population of over 250,000 people, making it bigger than most cities in Europe. It also boasted aqueducts that piped in fresh water, a bustling market district, public baths, and pyramids called cues in the Aztec language, Nahuatl. At these cues, the Aztec priestly castes made their human sacrifices. The Spanish detested the Aztec religious rites, comparing the indigenous religions to Islam, and they called pyramids mosques. They even referred to non-Christian Native Americans as moros, or moors, showing how Spain's reconquista affected Spanish colonialism. Partially because of this hostile attitude and other issues, the Spanish soon wore out their welcome in Tenochtitlan. They demanded too much food and gold in tribute, and they attempted to stop the sacrifices, often violently. The Spanish, once the guests of Montezuma, quickly took the king as their hostage. An angry mob gathered outside of the Spanish quarters, and Montezuma tried to pacify the crowd but was suddenly killed. Spanish sources stated that the furious crowd killed Montezuma by pelting him with stones, while later indigenous sources claimed that the Spanish actually killed him. Relations continued to deteriorate as the Spanish attacked Aztec civilians during a religious celebration. The Spanish claimed that the Aztecs were using the celebration as a feint to attack them. A feint, by the way, is a military term for a distraction. Cortes soon realized that he, his men, and his native allies would have to flee the city if they were to survive. They escaped the city on the night of June 30th, 1520, fleeing over a narrow causeway that connected the island city with the mainland. The Aztecs attacked Cortes and his party, killing about 400 Spaniards and about 4,000 of the native allies were killed as well, in what would later be known as El Noche Triste, the Sad Night. The Aztecs also sacrificed many of the prisoners they captured during this battle. The Aztecs continued to harass Cortez's retreating army all the way back to the coast. In 1521, Cortez and his allies, both European and indigenous, counterattacked the Aztecs fighting their way back to Tenochtitlan. Cortes and his men, drawing on the tactics and technology of the military revolution, built siege engines and flat-bottomed boats called brigantines and used gunpowder weapons and other dynamic tactics and technology to attack the Aztec city of Tenochtitlan. While the Aztecs had a sophisticated warrior class, 
and they were skilled in fighting pitched battles. Their tactics were adapted for capturing prisoners who would then be sacrificed. Additionally, the Aztecs' leather and textile armor, while light and well adapted for captive taking, offered very little protection against the Spanish troops' steel arrowheads and sword edges, or the muscle of the Spanish horses. Even though the tactics were faltering, the Aztecs continued their prisoner taking strategy and continued making sacrifices, even as the Spanish and their allies made gains against the city of Tenochtitlan. As the Aztecs grew weaker, more and more Mesoamericans joined the Spanish cause, seeing it as an opportunity to get even with the Aztecs, an old enemy. The greatest threat to the Aztecs, far more than Spanish steel or Mesoamerican revenge, was disease, namely smallpox. Smallpox, a disease caused by the variola virus, spread from cattle to humans in the Old World, but Native Americans had no immunity to this disease. Some scholars estimate that between smallpox and siege-induced famine, as much as 90% of the Aztec population died before the Spanish took control of the city. Tenochtitlan finally fell on August 13, 1521. The Spanish destroyed the town, leveling the pyramids, and filled the lake in with earth, creating the foundations for Mexico City, the present-day Mexican capital. They used stone from the demolished pyramids to build a cathedral and a plaza at the center of the new city. Both of these constructions can be seen today. The Spanish would use similar tactics, the conversion of native interpreters, shock and awe military tactics through the use of gunpowder, steel, and horses, and the establishment of alliances with indigenous people, including the hostage taking of their leadership to subdue other Native American civilizations like the Tarascans of the Yucatan Peninsula in 1530 and the Incans in Peru in 1572. Disease would also play a major role in these Spanish conquests as well, greatly diminishing indigenous manpower and resistance. With the defeat of the Aztecs, the predominant military power in Central America, the Spanish began the process of colonization and integration of the region, transforming it into New Spain. The propagation of Catholicism was key to the Spanish plan of integration and colonization. Native Americans who converted, especially those from the indigenous elite classes, could become nobility in the Spanish colonial empire, with some even intermarrying with Spanish immigrants to create a new mestizo upper class. Over time though, people of Indian and mixed heritage would be regarded as beneath those born in Spain, or people of anse Spanish ancestry born in the New World, called criollos or creoles. Keep in mind, though, that race and ethnicity were not as important to the Spanish as they would be to other colonizing powers. For the Spanish, religion and culture were more important than race. Consider these castas or caste paintings from 18th century New Spain. They show that people of indigenous heritage could be accorded elite status in new Spanish society if they adopted European life ways, dressing and living like the Spanish and the Criollos. It is also worth noting that most of the Spanish colonists who migrated to the New World after the initial conquests tended to be from elite classes back in Spain. Many were Hidalgos, second and third sons of noblemen who had no land titles or inheritance on the Iberian Peninsula, in spite of the fact that they were considered nobility. For the Hidalgos, a push factor would have been a lack of land in Spain. A pull factor would have been the abundance of land, gold, and cheap enslaved Amerindian labor in the New World. Before leaving for the Americas, though, Hidalgos were vetted by the Spanish Inquisition to make sure they were true Catholics and not crypto Jews or Muslims who had faked their conversion to avoid persecution. Dominican and Franciscan clerics, including those who had worked with the notorious Spanish Inquisition, migrated to the New World to convert the native populace, furthering Spanish colonialism. 
Many friars learn native languages and mix elements of Catholicism and indigenous beliefs, creating what some scholars call cultural syncretism, as was done in Mexico and further to the north, in the present-day North American Southwest. Also, this was done in Florida as well. In the Southwest, instead of tearing down indigenous religious structures called kivas, Spanish missionaries set up chapels inside the kivas. They also built missions across the region, many of which are still standing today. Spanish missionaries in the Southwest were fairly successful in the colonization of the region, although Spain did lose control of the Southwest in 1680 during the Pueblo Revolt and would not regain reg regional hegemony again until 1692. Back in Mexico, Spanish monks worked to translate and record stories from Native American history mythology, giving us texts like the Florentine Codex, preserving information that would have otherwise been lost in the conquest, just as monks have been doing in Europe since medieval times. Other religious clerics, however, were far less concerned with peaceful conversion or respecting Native cultures. These leaders, many of whom had been in the Inquisition, saw cultural syncretism as heresy and tried to destroy indigenous spiritual beliefs whenever they could. Mesoamerican natives of the lower classes who did not convert were forced to work on the encomienda system, farming and mining gold and silver for the Spanish. Living conditions for the encomienda slaves were terrible, but the system brought immense wealth to the Spanish empire. After the Spanish outlawed the encomienda system, New unfree labor systems, like repartimientos and haciendas, which were much more like serfdom, came about. Additionally, haciendas operate a lot like plantations further to the north in what would become the United States. These systems were created to further exploit the labor of the Spanish Empire's indigenous and mixed race underclasses. Most of the wealth produced in the Spanish colonies was transferred back to Spain on treasure galleons, where it was spent to fight wars against the Ottoman Turks and Protestant Christian powers in Europe. This approach to relations between the colonies and the metropole, or mother country, is called mercantilism. And in this arrangement, the colonies are intended to be dependent on the mother country, while also existing primarily for the purpose of enriching the metropole. It is also worth noting that Spain's mercantilist imperial model made Spanish maritime shipping, especially treasure galleons, ideal targets for pirates and privateers. State-sanctioned pirates of other colonial powers, especially Protestant ones like the English, who attacked the slow, lightly armed treasure galleons, stealing their cargoes of gold and silver. Although the encomienda system had been very profitable and a key as aspect of Spanish mercantilism, its abuse of Native Americans made this institution less popular over time, as reformists like Bartolomé de las Casas, a Catholic bishop, called for the oppressive institution's abolition. Las Casas saw the encomiendas as a brutal obstacle that prevented the mass conversion of Amerindians. Unfortunately, in its stead, Las Casas suggested the Spanish import enslaved Africans to replace native encomienda slaves. Spanish enslavement of Amerindians officially ended in 1542, although some enslavement of Native Americans occurred illegally in subsequent years. Keep in mind that encomiendas were replaced with other unfree labor systems, as we discussed previously. Now that we've discussed the Spanish conquest of Mexico and their colonization of Mexico and Mesoamerica, I want to talk more about the Spanish exploration and colonization of adjacent regions, um, the southeast of the United States, or what will become the United States, and also uh, what will become the southwest of the United States. The Spanish explored the southeast and the Mississippi River Valley between the years 
1539 and 1543. This expedition was initially led by um, Hernando de Soto. This is the route de Soto's expedition took through the southeast. They departed from Havana, Cuba in 1539. They traveled up the Florida Peninsula and they explored throughout the southeast, through Georgia and the Carolinas, through Alabama and Mississippi, and they even reached what is now uh, Louisiana and parts of uh, eastern Texas. Before they returned to what is now Mexico. Some points to keep in mind about DeSoto's expedition in the southeast. It lasted from 1539 to 1543, although DeSoto died of fever uh, in 1542 towards the end of the expedition. On the whole, the expedition was considered to be a failure by Spain. Uh, very little, if any, gold uh, was found. No colonies were established, and the Native Americans in the southeast were very militaristic. They were descendants of the Mississippian people who were very militaristic. And the Spanish and the Native Americans in the region had uh, many fights against each other. The Spanish certainly did very little to um, endear themselves to the Native Americans in the southeast. What's interesting to note is that there were elements of the Colombian exchange in DeSoto's expedition. DeSoto and his conquistadors brought razorback hogs with them as a food source. And many of these hogs escaped and would breed in the southeast. And descendants of those initial razorback hogs can still be found in the southeast today, where they're a big part of uh, the regional culture. This is the burial of Hernando de Soto. His body was uh, placed in the Mississippi River and weighted down. Uh, de Soto's followers feared that uh, if Native Americans found uh, his body, they might try to uh, desecrate it. Now we'll discuss Francisco de Coronado's expedition uh, of the Southwest. Uh, from 1540 to 1542. So it's happening at about the same time as De Soto's expedition of the Southeast. And Coronado's expedition is going to be more successful, as you'll see. Coronado and his explorers, which included Spanish conquistadors, uh, indigenous people from Mesoamerica, and even possibly uh, African people, um, traveled northward from uh, the Mexican heartland into the what we call the North American Southwest through Arizona, New Mexico, and parts of Texas, Oklahoma, and uh, what is now Kansas. As I mentioned on a previous slide, some uh, indigenous people from Mexico traveled with Coronado and his conquistadors. Uh, some of these people, like the Tlash Collins, had been allies of the Spanish during the conquest of Mexico, and they had been promised land and wealth if they went to the southwest to settle the region with the Spanish. Some things to keep in mind about uh, Coronado's expedition of the southwest and then later Spanish colonization of the southwest. On the whole, the Southwest had less wealth than Mesoamerica, but it had a lot more uh, wealth than the Southeast did. Because of this, uh, permanent colonies were established in the Southwest, uh, including by uh, Tlaxcalan Native Americans from Mexico who migrated uh, further to the north in the region. Spanish colonists, uh, especially missionary friars of the Franciscan and Dominican orders, as well as the Jesuits uh, introduced uh, Christianity, specifically Roman Catholicism, to the region. And these Spanish missions set up by these missionaries would play a major role in the Spanish colonization of the Southwest. These would not just be religious establishments, but uh, political establishments as well. Um, on the whole, though, fewer Spanish colonists went to the Southwest. Uh, as a result of this, the uh, indigenous population or the ratio of indigenous people to uh, Spanish and others um, was very, um, very high. Uh, because of this, uh, the indigenous people of the Southwest um, revolted in 1680 in what was called the Pueblo Revolt. And um, 
the Native Americans of the Southwest expelled the Spanish and Mestizo colonists uh, for over two years. It would not be until after 1683 that the Spanish would be able to uh, return and rebuild their colonial presence in the Southwest. The Spanish would also establish uh, settlements in adjacent regions, what is now uh, California and Texas. Uh, California would really not be settled until about 1769. It was too remote and disconnected from uh, New Spain, from Mexico. And in the case of Texas, um, Texas would not really be settled until about the 1690s. Uh, the indigenous people of Texas were deemed to be too hostile, and so the Spanish did not settle the region until much later in their colonial history. Scenes from the Spanish arrival in the Southwest. Notice um, the uh, missionary at the front of the uh, party of conquistadors highlighting the Catholic Church and the Catholic missionaries role in the colonization of the Southwest. Also here you can see scenes from the Pueblo Revolt of 1680. The Spanish missions in the Southwest were tools of both uh, religious conversion, but also of uh, colonization. Um, some of these missions were built in a more European style, reflecting a um, conversion approach that favored acculturation, that is, the removal of indigenous culture. Consider the uh, San Xavier mission in Tucson, Arizona, built in the late 1700s. Other missions uh, were built in a more syncretistic style, combining elements of European and indigenous uh, architecture, like the uh, San Miguel mission in Santa Fe, New Mexico, which uh, was built in about the year 1610. Some people claim that the San Miguel mission is the oldest uh, standing church in the continental United States. Spanish missionaries, including uh, Franciscan and Dominican um, friars and the Jesuits uh, traveled across the region, um, spreading Christianity to the indigenous people, playing a role in the Spanish colonization of the region. Um, generally speaking, these missionaries uh, were more successful in their conversion efforts when they uh, were more respectful of indigenous culture and practiced cultural syncretism, uh, building their mission buildings uh, using indigenous uh, architectural styles comparing uh, Catholic saints and Catholic rituals to uh, indigenous deities and indigenous uh, spirituality. Although there were some variations across the massive Spanish colonial empire, Spain generally exhibited the following patterns in its colonization. One, the Spanish justified their colonization and conquest of Native Americans by claiming that they were acting in the name of God and their monarchs. Two, the Spanish sought to integrate conquered people through the propagation of Christianity, sometimes through cultural syncretism, but other times through the destruction of indigenous belief systems. Three, the Spanish did not immigrate in large numbers to the New World, as other colonizers did, and the regions they settled in the Americas were more densely populated with Native Americans than the regions chosen by other colonizers. Because of this, the Spanish colonial authorities had to integrate conquered native elites into their leadership, while coercing lower class indigenous people into forced labor. Four, a cultural racial line between European and Indian and Mestizo people would develop over time in the Spanish colonies. Although this racial division was less defined for the Spanish than it was for other European colonial societies. This was due to the critical role that native allies played in the defeat of powers like the Aztecs, the Spanish approach to religious conversion, and the fact that the relatively few Spanish colonists came to the New World, compared with other colonial powers, also played a role in making Spanish society less racialized than other colonial societies. Five. Spain sought a close, centralized relationship with its colonies, in which settlements existed for the good of the mother country, and would send as much wealth as they could, primarily in the form of gold and silver, back to Spain. Spain's strategies for the conquest of the Americas and their approach to colonialism would have a profound impact on how the Hispanophone, 
Spanish-speaking nations of Latin America would develop over time. This is a map showing uh, the Spanish colonial empire. Keep in mind that the Spanish did not control all of these territories at once. Some of these regions were taken control of later after the Spanish had lost other parts of their empire. But I show you this slide to give you an idea just of how large uh, the Spanish presence was in the Americas, particularly in the western portions of North America and then along the uh, western Pacific coast of South America. Before we move on to discussing the other uh, European colonial powers, I want to address uh, something called uh, the Black Legend and the White Legend debate. You may have heard of these terms before, uh, the Black Legend or the White Legend, in reference to uh, Spanish colonialism, but I want to discuss um, these ideas a little bit more uh, deeply here. The Black Legend um, holds that the Spanish were uniquely cruel and oppressive to Native Americans, far more so than any other uh, European colonizing power. In contrast, the White Legend says that uh, the Spanish were kind to Native Americans and wanted to help them uh, in their attempts to uh, acculturate them and convert them to Christianity, and that they actually cared more about Native Americans and were better to Native Americans than other European powers. Um, the Spanish created the white legend to justify their own uh, colonial exploits. Uh, and also the white legend in recent years has been used just to kind of justify European colonization of the Americas as a whole. So the use of the white legend actually has changed in recent years. Initially it was used by the Spanish. Now it's generally used by anyone who's looking to justify um, European colonization of the Americas. Going back in time, though, other European colonial powers, especially the English, they developed the Black Legend to condemn uh, the Spanish, their primary enemies, and to justify their own uh, colonial exploitation. The truth, of course, is uh, something in the middle. The Spanish colonial empire was far larger than other European powers, so there's going to be some variation based on where in the uh, Spanish empire you are. Also keep in mind that the Spanish colonial model is going to be somewhat different uh, than other European colonial models because the Spanish settled parts of the Americas had a, had a much, much higher indigenous population, especially Mesoamerica and the Andes region. And of course, Spanish cultural traditions, especially the Reconquista, uh, would have impacted their approach to dealing with uh, non-European, uh, non-Christian people. We have discussed the Spanish approach to colonialism in great detail because they were the first European power to establish large permanent colonies in the Americas and because they were able to quickly turn these colonies into a large centralized overseas empire that existed for centuries. Now we will turn our attention to some of the other colonial powers, although most of them will be discussed in less detail, as their colonial exploits were far less extensive in the Americas, and because they often left fewer written records behind due to their lower number of colonists. Two other colonial powers that established colonies in the Americas, but in a less extensive manner, were the Dutch, i.e. the Netherlands, and Spain's western neighbor, the Portuguese. Both of these nations had fewer economic and human resources than the larger European empires like England, France, and Spain. Thus, they had to make a different approach to colonialism. This lack of resources forced these smaller powers to play to their own cultural strengths. The Portuguese had been the leaders in maritime navigation and exploration during the Age of Discovery's early years, developing new naval technologies like the hardy sail-powered caravels and carracks, which made travel on a stormy Atlantic Ocean far more realistic than it would have been using rowing-powered galleys that plied the sea lanes of the calmer Mediterranean Sea. The Portuguese were also skilled map makers, producing some of the first and most accurate maps of the West African coast and the Americas as well. In fact, the word America is a Latinized term that comes from Americo Vespucci, 
a Florentine map maker who worked for Portugal, and traversed what is now Brazil from 1501 to 1502. Amerigo became America. The Portuguese did not have the economic and military resources of Spain, so they used their technology, like their advanced caravels, to explore as much of the New World as they could. Then, Portuguese map makers, cartographers, and explorers would use their findings from the voyages to create detailed maps by which they would claim the New World, at least in the eyes of other European powers, whom they hoped would recognize the maps they made. In this way, maps were a political tool that facilitated colonialism, assigning Portuguese domain over large swaths of the New World and its people. With this information in mind, I want to discuss the Portuguese exploration of the Americas. Pedro Alvarez de Cabral of Portugal explored what would become Brazil in the year 1500. Pedro Alvarez de Cabral took 13 ships on a trade voyage to India in 1500. Um, their initial plan was to sail around the coast of Africa. One of the reasons why the Portuguese wanted to sail around the coast of Africa on the way to India was because they hoped to find uh, Prester John, a mythical Christian uh, sub-Saharan African king who had become an ally uh, of Christian Europeans against the uh, Ottoman Empire. Uh, on the way south, the Portuguese landed on the coast of Brazil. Initially, they believed they had just discovered another island, not a whole new continent. Um, due to the Treaty of Tordesillas, which had been put into effect uh, by the Pope a few years earlier, uh, the Portuguese did not have a lot of early interest in Brazil. It was too close to uh, Spanish territory in the Americas. Remember, the Treaty of Tordesillas basically divided the world between the two leading Catholic maritime powers, Spain and Portugal. As time went on, though, the Treaty of Tordesillas would become less important, and the Portuguese would eventually colonize what would become Brazil, um, starting in 1534, and in 1565, they would found the uh, Rio de Janeiro settlement. Uh, the major industry of the Brazil colony would be uh, sugar. Uh, this sugar would be grown on plantations worked by uh, African enslaved people. And this is a map of uh, Cabral's voyage. You can see that his uh, ships, they sail south and west before turning back to uh, the east to go around Africa on the way to India. This is a uh, artist's rendition of what their initial landing uh, on uh, Brazil might have looked like. This is the uh, Portuguese colonial empire at its greatest extent. Uh, keep in mind that the Portuguese did not maintain control of all of these territories at the same time. Some of these territories would be lost to other uh, European colonial powers. And some areas also would uh, break away and uh, gain independence on their own. Certainly like Brazil, for example. Portugal was also interested in converting Native Americans and integrating them often by force into their empire even though they did not have the same level of military and human power that the other Europeans did. Due to their lack of human resources, the Portuguese were also quicker to import African slaves to the New World to make up for their shortage of labor. To conclude, the Portuguese colonial system was similar to the Spanish approach in that both nations wanted to convert Amerindians. At the same time, the Portuguese model also stood out as different because of Portugal's limited resources, leading this country to mark out its territory with maps, while also importing slaves in large numbers to serve as a colonial labor force. Although they were from a completely different part of Europe, the Low Countries, and practiced a different form of Christianity, Protestantism, there were many similarities between the Dutch and the Catholic Portuguese approach to colonization. The Dutch, like the Portuguese, were also skilled sailors, having a long-standing naval and maritime tradition. 
the Dutch gained naval renown during their War of Independence against Spain, as seen during the Siege of Leiden in 1574. The Dutch War of Independence against Spain was one of the many European religious wars. During the Battle of Leiden, the Dutch army, with the help of its Protestant, English, and French Huguenot allies, destroyed the dikes that kept their country from flooding. They then sailed their ships across their own flooded countryside and using the vessels to defeat the Spanish. With that background information about the Dutch in mind, now we can talk about their colonization of North America. Initially, the Dutch explored the Atlantic coast in 1609. That expedition was led by Henry Hudson. Henry Hudson was actually English, but he sailed under the Dutch flag. This is fairly common. A lot of the explorers uh, for these European colonial powers did not come from the countries for whom they explored. Uh, for example, Christopher Columbus was an Italian, yet he sailed for the Spanish. And Henry Hudson was an Englishman who sailed for the Dutch. Some points to keep in mind about Henry Hudson's voyages. The Dutch came into the colonial game last due to being part of the Spanish Empire until 1581. We discussed the Dutch uh, wars of independence against Spain on a previous slide. Early explorations were funded by the Dutch East India Company, and they were led by Henry Hudson, an Englishman. Um, Hudson's first voyage explored the East Coast uh, from the Carolinas up through what is now New England and uh, southeastern Canada. On his second voyage, um, Henry Hudson sailed much further to the north through the Hudson Strait into Hudson Bay. Hudson and his crew on a, their second voyage were looking for the Northwest Passage, a water route through the Northern Atlantic Ocean to reach the Pacific and Asia. By this point, Europeans knew that they could sail west to reach the Far East, but the journey around South, Ca South America and around Cape Horn was very long and very dangerous, so they hoped to find an easier Northwest Passage. Hudson and his crew did not find the North Path, Northwest Passage, and their failure to find the passage would lead to Hudson's crew going on a mutiny and marooning Hudson in the Hudson Bay in 1611. The Dutch would set up their first permanent settlement in what would become the United States at New Netherland in 1614. Here is an artist's representation of Hudson and a couple of his loyal crew members who were left to die in Hudson Bay after their failure to find the Northwest Passage in 1611. Sailors would not find a Northwest Passage until the 20th century. In the Americas, the Dutch spread their empire across the water, penetrating up the Hudson River named after English explorer Henry Hudson, who led a Dutch expedition there in 1609. The Dutch were also traders as well, and believed in compensating Native American powers for land, rather than simply taking it by force, as much as possible. The Dutch, under Peter Shagan, purchased Manhattan Island from the Lenape Indians for about 60 guilders worth of trinkets in 1624. Contrary to popular opinion, the Lenape Indians did not pawn off their land for worthless baubles. These so-called trinkets, including glass beads and copper kettles, had tremendous spiritual meaning for Native Americans, who used these goods for religious rites. The Lenape, however, like most Native Americans in North America, did not practice land ownership, and probably thought that they were simply allowing the Dutch colonists to temporarily occupy Manhattan, rather than settle it perpetually. In the future, the Lenape and other Native Americans, realizing the Dutch intended to permanently possess the land, would drive harder bargains, demanding more goods in their trades, including clothing, tools, and muskets, as seen in the Dutch purchase of Staten Island in 1630. The Dutch were also skilled mapmakers, like the Portuguese, 
and would use these maps to signal their ownership of territory in the New World, at least to other Europeans. The Dutch, unlike other European colonial powers, were actually very religiously pluralistic. They were far less concerned with converting Native Americans to Christianity. Additionally, the Dutch made it a point to allow people of all Christian sects, and even Jews, to settle in their American colonies. The Dutch had to be more religiously permissive because of their limited numbers, which was a positive. On the negative side, the Dutch made up for their lack of numbers by bringing enslaved people to the New World in great numbers, much like the Portuguese as well. Also like the Portuguese, the Dutch would become some of Europe's most infamous and prolific slave traders. Here is a list of similarities between the Dutch and the Portuguese colonial models. The French colonial method bore similarities to the Spanish, Portuguese, and Dutch colonial models. The French were mostly Catholic, and Catholic French colonists, like the Spanish, declared that they were settling the New World in the name of God, the Catholic Church, and the divinely blessed ruler of France. The French, like the Spanish, would show crosses and sign documents to the Native Americans. The first Frenchman to explore North America was Jacques Cartier, who led an expedition in 1534. Cartier, though, explored land that would become Canada, not the United States. Cartier would make a total of three voyages for France to what is now Canada. He sailed around Newfoundland and he sailed up the St. Lawrence River. At the time, France was embroiled in a bitter civil war over religion between Catholics and Protestants. Cartier himself was Catholic. During his third voyage, Cartier attempted to establish a permanent settlement. But this settlement would ultimately fail because the weather in Canada was too cold, the Native Americans in the region were deemed to be too hostile, and the gold and precious metals that Cartier and the French hoped to find in Canada simply were not there. They were not in the part of Canada that uh, Cartier and his settlers were uh, living in. The French would not um, discover a viable source of wealth in the Americas until the 1600s when they began the fur trade. In addition to Cartier's explorations in what is now Canada, French Protestants um, called Huguenots would make settlements in what is now the southeastern United States, but they were not part of Cartier's expedition. Um, the most notable French Protestant settlement was Fort Caroline in what is now uh, Florida near Jacksonville which was destroyed by the uh, Catholic Spanish in 1568. The French would actually not establish a permanent lasting settlement in North America until uh, Quebec under Samuel Champlain in uh, 1608 through 1609. This is a map of Cartier's second voyage, wherein he and his explorers sailed up the St. Lawrence River they sailed into the interior of Canada, hoping to find riches. They did not find the kind of wealth they were looking for. On Cartier's third voyage, again, he and his crew sailed up the St. Lawrence River, this time establishing a settlement that would ultimately fail. It's not until the 1600s that the French make a permanent lasting settlement in uh, the North American mainland. The first permanent, lasting French settlement in Canada was established by Samuel de Champlain from 1608 to 1609. Champlain and his crew traveled to Canada and up the St. Lawrence River. They impressed local Native Americans, particularly the Wendat slash Huron people, with their muskets and their artillery, and they made an alliance with uh, the Wendat slash Huron people against uh, what are called the Iroquois or Haudenosaunee uh, Confederation. They also fought uh, the Mohawks as well. 
So Champlain and his followers quickly made an alliance with Native Americans against other Native Americans. And the settlement, of course, was called Quebec. And Quebec's economy was based around the fur trade with Native Americans. This colony was meant to be a partnership between Europeans and Natives. Champlain would also explore further to the south in what is now the U.S., um, but the French will not establish permanent colonies in the future United States until later. Uh, at Biloxi, Mississippi in 1699, their first really major settlement in what will become the United States was at New Orleans, which was a little bit later. Here is an artist's representation of Champlain and his ships arriving in Canada. They met with um, the Wendat slash Huron people and impressed them with their military technologies, leading them to create an alliance with this group of uh, Native Americans. Here is a um, illustration or an engraving of um, the Wendat slash Hurons fighting against their enemies alongside of uh, French musketeers seen here. It's believed this musketeer in the front is actually supposed to be Samuel uh, de Champlain taking part in uh, this battle. In addition, the French included performative ceremonies with their symbols, like parades, when they were signaling their colonization of the Americas. The French recognized that it was important to perform these rituals, parades, possession ceremonies, alongside presenting documents and crosses to indigenous people. Of all the European nations that engaged in colonization in the Atlantic New World, the French had the largest population, double that of Spain and four times that of England. Yet the French crown, like the Spanish, did not want too many of its subjects leaving the motherland and sailing to the New World, seeing these emigres as human resources who would fight in the country's wars and till in its fields and be the next generation of French subjects in the world. The French government did not want too many of these people to leave. The Catholic Church and the Catholic French government, however, unlike Spain, did not vet the people who left for the New World in the same way that the Spanish did through the use of the Inquisition. In fact, the Spanish government hoped that its Protestant minority, the Huguenots, would leave the country and go to the Americas. Huguenots set up Protestant colonies like Fort Caroline near present-day Jacksonville, Florida in 1564. Catholic French explorers like Jacques Cartier had explored Canada in the 1530s but did not settle in the region, seeing it as too cold and foreboding. Unfortunately for the settlers of Fort Caroline, Catholic Spanish colonists from St. Augustine, established in 1565, destroyed the Protestant colony in 1569, killing most of its inhabitants, demonstrating how the European wars of religion had spilled over into the New World. Events like Henry of Navarre's conversion to Catholicism in order to become King of France in 1572 and the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre that same year destroyed the Huguenot leadership in France. French Huguenot settlement in the New World ceased as Catholic France intensified the persecution of its Protestant minority. The Huguenots became too weak to put together their own colonies. The Edict of Nantes in 1598 ended French religious civil war, but it left the Huguenots as second-class citizens in France, ending their colonial ambitions and ability to escape to the New World. Almost a century later, in 1685, the French absolute monarch Louis XIV revoked the Edict of Nantes, making Protestantism illegal, but this persecution actually spawned a new wave of French Protestant migration to the New World. In this way, for many French colonists, religious persecution in the old country was a major push factor in inspiring immigrants to leave France and come to the Americas, although the immigration patterns would change over time.
Although the French were religiously intolerant in their homeland, the French colonial approach to religion and conversion was far more open and less forceful than the conversion styles taken by other colonial powers, both Catholic and Protestant. French priests who became missionaries penetrated deep into the North American interior, traveling by water up rivers and establishing missions within Native American territory. The French missionaries tried to respect the cultural beliefs of the Native Americans they were trying to convert, and they had fairly successful results, although there were some key exceptions, of course. While early Protestant Huguenot French settlements like Fort Caroline were destroyed, French Catholic settlements established in what is now Canada, first at Port Royal in 1605 and Quebec in, 16 under, in 1608 under Samuel de Champlain actually succeeded. Quebec would become a major base of operations for French expeditions into the North American interior, reaching as far south and west as the Great Lakes and the Ohio country in the Missouri River and the Mississippi River Delta. The French would establish major settlements in New Orleans in 1718 and St. Louis in 1764. Before I continue discussing uh, French colonists, I wanna talk about the French colonial economy. Initially, the French had hoped to find gold and gems in North America, but after failing to find uh, precious metals and uh, jewels, they switched to the fur trade. Uh, fur was the most important uh, French colonial trade good. Uh, the French traders and colonists would um, buy fur pelts, mostly beaver pelts, from Native Americans, from their Native American allies. They would trade glassware, beads, textiles, iron tools, copper kettles, and even firearms for this. Uh, type of what you might call brown gold. By the way, brown gold is also a term used for uh, tobacco as well, so uh, I don't want you to get confused um, if you hear the term brown gold again. French trappers um, could also go out and get fur for themselves, which sometimes led to friction between the French and uh, the Native Americans. The fur would be taken and uh, sold back in Europe for maximum profits, and this fur was very useful, very valuable, because it was used to make fur coats and fur hats, all of which were uh, very useful during uh, Europe's cold winters. Further to the south, um, in what is now uh, the territory around New Orleans, Louisiana, for example, and also in the Caribbean, the uh, French colonies instead uh, grew sugar on plantations. And these plantations were worked primarily by African enslaved people. The fur trade was not a viable business in France's southern colonies because the animals that have fur uh, in the south, uh, their fur is not as thick, it's not as desirable. So instead, the French fur in the south uh, had more of a plantation economy based around sugar. French soldiers and traders traveled with the missionaries into the interior, establishing small settlements that were based on the pursuit of wild game and trading with Native Americans. The French colonies, being based on trade, did not require large labor forces. Thus, the French did not really enslave Native Americans in the same way that other European, especially Spanish powers, did. The French colonies in North America would also not heavily rely on slave labor until the 18th century, as the settlements of New Orleans and St. Louis became larger. On the whole, Native American powers got along fairly well with the French colonists because they came in small numbers and were comparatively respectful of Native American life ways to the point that many French settlers and missionaries to contemporary observers had begun to live more like Indians than Europeans. Native American leaders recognized that the French were critical trading partners Native American traders sold beaver pelts to the French colonists, and the French colonists in turn sold Native Americans copper kettles, glassware, dyed wool cloth, and firearms. Beaver pelts were to the French empire what gold and silver was to the Spanish. 
Beaver pelts were a value co valuable commodity in northern European winters. The imported fur pelts could be made into hats and coats to help people survive the cold of Europe. Over time, the goods that the French sold their Indian trading partners, including firearms, became ensconced in Native American culture, especially religious rites. Male French settlers also married Native American women and produced mixed race children in these marriages. The offspring of these unions, called Métis, combined the life ways of their native and European parents, creating a new culture. Métis communities still exist throughout the U.S. and Canadian Midwest. In conclusion, the French method of colonization was probably the least disruptive of Native American culture and life because it was based heavily on trade, primarily of furs, and because the French kept their settlements fairly small. Because of this, French missionaries, hunters, and traders were able to penetrate deep into the interior of North America along bodies of water, reaching the Great Lakes region and other points further south and west. The French kept their colonial parties small, and their people, including the missionaries, tried to respect Native American lifeways and religious beliefs, even as they tried to convert them to Christianity. The French did not want to ruin their lucrative trade opportunities by being too oppressive. The children of marriages between the French and Native Americans, the Métis, adopted elements of both French and Native American culture. The French approach to colonization would lead many Native American peoples to see France as an ally in conflicts against other European colonial powers. For context, the French were like the Portuguese and the Dutch in that they sent few settlers to the New World. They were like the Spanish and the Portuguese because they emphasized the conversion of Native Americans. Finally, they were like the Dutch as they used bodies of water to traverse the North American continent. Their empire was built on trade, and the French colonists, not the mother country, were pluralistic in their allowing of Protestants to come to their colonies and their respect for Native American culture and religious beliefs. The French stood out from other colonizers, however, in that they did not set up oppressive labor systems in North America. They did not enslave Indians, and they would not bring significant numbers of African slaves to their colonies until the 18th century even though other colonial powers brought in enslaved people from Africa much earlier. As a side note, I should mention that I am discussing the French settlements in North America here. The French would rely heavily on slavery and other forms of unfree labor in their Caribbean colonies, but we do not have time to discuss those colonies during our course.